in search of soil. Jim, when you look at soil, at the very basics, for people that might not understand soil and they might think it's, hey, this is just a inert thing in the ground that I grow plants in, how do you describe soil to farmers? Um, I would have to say that soil is a living organism. Um, you know, when, when you look at the composition of soil, it's 45% mineral, and it should be about 50% pore space. But the most important part of that soil, what really makes soil uh, what it is, is that other, you know, four to five percent, three to four or five percent. A lot of our soils are now down to two percent organic matter. But the organic matter to me is like the head and the brain and the heart. It controls so many things in a soil. I mean, I can remember uh, I was interviewed about marsh, uh, Martian soils. And I said, that's really not soil because it don't have organic matter, doesn't have the living organisms in it. That's what makes soil. Uh, otherwise, soil is really just ground up rock. And if you look at sand, silt and clay, uh, the only difference between those three is the size of the particles. Sand will break down into silt. Silt breaks down into clay. And uh, that's just ground up rock. It doesn't become soil till you add the biology. I know from looking at a lot of the work that you've done, like you've talked a lot of compaction in the past. And, and let's let's focus on that. We'll circle back to organic matter a little bit down the line. For pore space and compaction, how big of a problem is that when it comes to soils? You've seen a lot of ag soils throughout the Midwest. When you look at them, can you talk about a compacted soil and how that maybe performs differently than a soil that's looser and friable? So it all goes back to that carbon, okay? So when you till a soil, that's really what creates the compaction. Um, you know, I, I really get upset or I, I upset a lot of engineers because they will tell you that soil compaction is due to wheel traffic. But, you know, it'd be interesting to do an experiment and we could take 100 people and put them across the field and put them a foot apart and have them dig in the soil and every one of them will find a compacted layer there. Now, are you telling me that tires went evenly across that whole field. No, that is where the tillage tool went and it's smoothing. What happens is it smooths that soil when it's wet and uh, that's causing the compaction. It's uh, basically if you take two clay particles, they have a negative charge. You put a positive atom in between there, it's going to set up like concrete. And that's what's happening in our soil. We're losing the organic matter with the tillage. And what we call soil compaction is really just poor soil structure. That's really what most soil. Now, does that mean that if I have a heavy equipment and I go across the field? Yes, I can cause soil compaction, but but rain can cause soil compaction, okay? If you get if you plow a field and that that soil will start to settle, you'll lose pore space uh, as it rains. And and the rain is coming down sometimes 30 mile per hour, it can actually compact your soil. Rain and gravity are also, you know, maybe not as much of an extent. The heavy equipment is is major, but really what soil compaction is due to or poor soil structure is due to a lack of living roots. It's due to a lack of biology in our soils. Our soils, we've lost anywhere from 50, 60, as much as 80% of our organic matter from our soils. And when you do that, what happens is they shrink. OK, I, I do this quite regularly. I mean, anybody can do this. Just go out to a fence row and look at the fence row and you will see anywhere from a six to nine inch elevation difference where you have undisturbed soils. And, and the difference between that and, say, your end, end row. Now, on the end rows, it tends to be a little more compacted, but the difference there is due to the tillage, we've taken all that organic matter, put it up into the atmosphere, and what has happened is our soils have shrunk, okay? And that's that, that lack of pore space. Now, all we have left is mainly the mineral portion of the soil, and it's cemented together by those negative and positive charges, and it becomes very dense, the way you can break that up, you can do it with tillage, but unfortunately, you're just making it worse. But a root will do the same thing. It'll push the soil down, it pushes out, and it physically lifts that soil, expands it like an accordion. And then when that root decomposes, now you get the pore spit. 
space, okay? And that's how you start to expand your soil is by adding roots. And you start to add that organic matter. And that's what makes good soil is the organic matter. Then we start, instead of forming micro aggregates, those are the real fine, tiny pieces of uh, soil that that's now we're going to start to form what we call macro aggregates. Those are the little pieces of organic matter and roots and clay and silt and sand particles kind of all glued together with the root exudates and the microbial poop. And that will allow the air and the water and the gas exchange. And that will start to expand our soil. And that's when you see the soil crumble. That's when you know you have good soil structure. Okay. And that's that's what we're trying to do. When you look at compaction, you have organic matter being depleted, and then you also have the actual tilth of the structure of the soil being changed by, say, tillage. Is there a bigger cause of compaction in there? Is it the tilling, which breaks up that natural supportive pore space and loosens it up so then when rain comes that wants to make it settle? Or is it the fact that you're now oxygenating that soil, bringing the organic matter up, it's volatilizing off, it's burning off, it's being consumed by the the microbes in the soil, and then you get both. So is there one side that is more problematic? I would say it's just a combination of both. It's that whole process. When you oxygenize a soil, the microbes go nuts and they eat up the most important part, what's lacking in most of our conventional soils is the active organic matter. So the active organic matter is your root exudates, your sugars, your polysaccharides in the soil that give us good soil structure. And when you oxygenize it and you turn it over or you, you really fluff it up like that, what happens is you, you put a whole bunch of oxygen in there and the microbes go nuts and then the microbes start to um consume all that active carbon and then pretty soon what will happen is you, you lose all your your structure uh it's micro aggregates and not as many macro aggregates and pretty soon your soils start to shrink so it's really kind of a and then the other problem that happens is when you take that tillage tool across that now what you're doing is you're taking all those uh, micro aggregates and you're cementing them together because i can go out in any field i just did this the other day for uh, another video and uh, we went out there and we dug in a soil that had been no-till for since 1992 quote no-till uh oh it really wasn't no-till the guy told me that he'd done some turbo till and i could tell you the exact depth that he turbo tilled it and he told me what years he did it you know it was a couple of years apart but we could find those levels in the soil and that soil broke apart on an even plane straight across right to the depth that he tilled that soil and we could see that in the soil then we went to another conventional field and that field was like a solid chunk of concrete they had done so much tillage that you know the soil was just really hard really dense of course it was dry out and it's always going to look worse when it's dry but but you could get in that that soil and it was just it's a solid had no no structure to it whatsoever so the more you do the more oxygen you put in and then you're going to start getting these levels i can still find uh, the plow pan from 50 60 years ago even though guys haven't plowed for 50 60 years we can find that level still in the soil it's still there if you're doing conventional tillage now if you start doing no-till cover crops start growing a lot of wheat and things like that it's it's a little harder to find because they're breaking that up the more roots you get in there it takes a little time but they'll break those levels up and they can get down there the biggest thing i can remember um uh, a, a quick story is we went to minnesota oh probably 10 years ago most beautiful soil i've ever seen that the soil was the color of your shirt okay just pure black i said oh this is such beautiful looking soil we dug in the soil and we could find a compacted layer. And their biggest complaint was, I said, well, you guys must get pretty good yields here. Well, it really varies. He said, depends on how much rain we get during the summer. And yet there was a, a field right next to it. They had a dry summer and the corn didn't look very good. 125, 150 bushel corn, okay? Should raise 250, easy. Okay, right next to it was this beautiful no-till field and uh, had the same amount of moisture. Well, we went over there, no compaction. The roots were getting real deep. So we dug a, a hole where the conventional soil was. Guess what? 
They plow their soils every single year, whether it's corn or soybeans, compacted layer there. The roots could not get to the moisture six inches below where the roots were. There was more soil there, but they couldn't reach it because of that compacted area. So compaction is a major problem. It can last for multiple years. We have seen uh, in, in research studies where we compacted the soil, it can last easily nine to 10 years if you don't do something to remediate that. The best way to remediate, it, it's slower but it's used roots. Roots is what's going to heal our soils, but that can take two to three years to break up those compacted layers. So from a, si a single you tillage, you could see that plow pan last nine to 10 years? Wow. Uh, a single tillage, but in our research studies, what we did is we took zero 10 and 20 ton loads. That's, this was started way back in the 70s. And so they used the same methodology. We had no-till fields, and then we had uh, conventional fields. I can tell you the conventional fields had poor soil structure and more compaction than the no-till fields. And what I'd really like to do now is do no-till with a cover crop. But you know, these these were set up 50 years ago. They're not going to change them very quickly. These are ongoing long-term research studies that is being done by Ohio State. Okay. But all I'm telling you is that it's a combination of tillage. The wheel compaction is a big issue, especially on some of our big farms now. I mean, we have uh, grain carts that can hold two semi loads worth of grain. Why you would want to put that much grain on that many axle loads growing across your field makes no sense to me whatsoever. But on really big fields, yes, we're going to get wheel traffic. But a lot of poor soil structure is due to excess tillage. The tillage is causing that when you go down and you dig in the soil and you go down two inches, I can tell you that probably some light uh, some type of tillage, vertical tillage, anywhere from two to four inches, they'll go down and that you can find those layers in the soil. Uh, you can find where the tip of that tillage tool went because there's almost like a perfect break in the soil, especially when it's dry right now. You might not see it as much when it's wet, but when it's dry right now, you can dig in the soil. You can see exactly where you tilled um, either last year or the last couple of years. It, it'll break perfectly on an even plane across that whole field. And I can dig almost anywhere in that field and I can I can find that same level. So again, tillage is a major, major part of the problem that we're having with poor soil structure, what we call soil compaction. Yeah, you know, one of the big principles of soil conservation is minimize soil disturbance. So when it comes to no-till right. or quote no-till, yes. are there... Yes. Are there degrees of tillage that you think are more harmful sure. than others? Like you, there's a lot of proponents of vertical tillage yes. of, you know, at least maybe I, in the conversion process of going from conventional to no till. And then you have, yeah. you know, going back to a mold board plow, which is going to do complete inversion mm -hmm. to on, on a smaller scale. We right. see a lot of people using tillers, which are doing, you know, inversion. Right. How do you, how do you view tillage right. on a, on a, curve of severe to extreme uh, and are they going to lead to the same types of results oh yes all tillage is going to be harmful but if i was to start with the one that i would give you the 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 best results would probably be your strip till because what you can do is you can take maybe a couple inch zone that you're going to till that will dry that soil out. Every time you do tillage, you dry the soil out a half inch to an inch, okay? And that's a zone where that you can get good seed to soil contact. You can get your corn, your beans, or whatever you're trying to grow. If we're talking more row crops, corn and beans would be the big ones, but uh, maybe cotton or something like that. But you could put it in that little zone, but then you've got a nice area on either side of it that's undisturbed. And that area can heal. And as those roots grow out, they're going to get into that undisturbed soil. So for me, uh, kind of an area where guys can kind of make the transition would be on strip till. I, I don't, I, I, I'll lot, you know, I'm, I'm going to say, you know, all tillage is going to be bad, but strip till is probably one of those ways that we can transition. And maybe at some point, You'll, you'll heal that soil enough that you say, it's almost like training wheels, okay? I need a crutch, 
my crutch is a strip till. I'm going to do that for maybe the first five, 10 years. Once I get the rest of the soil healed up and I get good water infiltration and I'm getting good nutrient recycling, well, maybe I don't even need that crutch anymore. Maybe I don't need the training wheels. Maybe I can throw them away and go to full-blown no-till. So I think that would be the optimal go is, you know, uh, deal is to go to full-blown no-till. But no-till by itself is only about 40% of the solution. You've got to have the live roots in there, the extra roots from the cover crops. you got to have that soil covered with living roots year-round. That's what's going to heal your soil. If you're just doing no-till by itself, it's going to take you a long, long time. You're going to see those compacted layers in there for many, many years because you're only getting one set of roots, whatever crop you're growing, and you might only grow that crop for maybe four months five months out of the year at most, you got to have live roots in there year round. That's just the way most of our soils developed. Live roots is what's going to heal your soils and make them better. And it's going to add that carbon back into the soil. Root turnover, that's why the prairie soils, 50% of those roots turned over every year. That's why out in the prairies, we have uh, soil profiles that are 10, 15, 20, 30 feet deep with organic matter because half of those prairie roots turned over every year. The area that I live in, in Ohio, we had mainly forested areas and these tall oak trees would live 100, 200 years and there was very little root turnover. So most of the organic matter came from the leaves and from the roots that turned over in the top six inches, but then our, our soils aren't very well developed because we didn't have very much root turnover. As you go out west and you get into areas that don't have trees, those prairie plants, the roots are turning over 50%. And some of those roots go down, you know, 5, 10, 15 feet deep in the soil. And that's how they get those really high levels of organic matter uh, on those what we call mollusol soils is what they are. And those are some of the, the most productive soils in the world, okay, is the mollusols. And what's interesting is you can change your soil to make it act like a mollusol. And if you, if you want to do that, you have to have a large turnover, raise as many crops as you can, and have a large turnover of roots, and then you'll transition your soil to becoming more and more like a mollusol soil. Soils are not static. They're changing all the time. And, and uh, you can either do management that makes them better or what we've done in the last 50 to 75 years is most of our soils are degraded and we've made them worse. We've lost the majority of organic matter from our soils. So management is key to that. And uh, yeah. that's why we gotta, gotta find ways to make it better. What have you seen with your work when you look at soil cuts, going into a field, doing an excavation in the middle of a field and looking down across the soil profile? If, if cover crops can go in and help break up these compaction layers, why can't some of our mm -hmm. cash crops like corn break through those layers? And, and what's actually happening to those roots of those compaction layers when you get down into the cut yeah. and look at them? Corn is actually uh, quite a bit better than soybeans. Soybeans are the worst. For, for every unit of nitrogen that, that you're making with soybeans, uh, you're getting two units of acid. And uh, soybeans also have a very low carbon to nitrogen ratio. They don't add a lot of organic matter. I mean, you can harvest a field of soybeans. And if you look at the residue on, on the above ground, and really what we're worried about is mainly concerned about is the residue below ground. We need some residue on the surface to armor it. But what you get above ground, you generally get below ground. And the problem is on soybeans, we're just not adding enough organic matter. We're burning more organic matter than we're graining. So then, then we're gaining. So what happens over time is your soils get harder and denser when you grow a lot of soybeans. If you really want to add organic matter to your soils, if you were to go continuous corn, not that that's a good thing, but if you were, there are some guys that will grow continuous corn. What we see is when you look at the research, every year you grow corn, uh, corn you add a little more organic matter because it, it has a big root. And they're not fine, but they're very big. And that's part of the problem. Those big roots can't break up the soil as well as the fine roots. So you'll get more organic organic matter with corn than you will with with um, soybeans and you can actually build 
your uh, organic matter levels with corn. So if you have corn in the rotation more often, uh, you'll, you'll see it. Now, maybe that's not good from a, a, a rotational aspect, but the way we can make up for that is if I'm going to grow soybeans, well, then I need to put in another crop after the soybeans, as something like cereal rye or winter oats or annual rye grass, something like that, that will add the roots and we can get more root turnover. And if I could add, you know, maybe several things in a mixture, I want some shallow roots. I want some deep roots. Uh, I want some uh, thick roots and thin roots. You want all different kinds of roots. The more diversity you get out there, the quicker you're going to be able to break up that uh, compassion. Our biggest problem with corn is a lot of times uh, the soybeans have compacted the soil so much that when the corn starts to grow, when it hits a compacted area, what happens? goes off at a 90 degree angle. We call those uh, J roots. You know, they go off at a 90 degree angle and they have to wait until they can uh, stretch out until they can find a crack in the soil. And then they'll go down that crack and then they'll spread out. Well, that takes some time. And then that generally hurts your yields. OK, so it's a lot better if that corn can go straight down and just really spread out and not be restricted. If, if you get a great big ball of corn roots out there that are growing down, you know, four or five feet deep in the soil and just really spreading out, that's going to add a lot of organic matter to your soil. And eventually what they'll do is most roots are following the same path almost every year. So when one crop's done, the next crop is going to look for the path of least resistance. It'll either find a crack, a root hair, or some of these bigger macro aggregates in or macropores, I'm sorry, macropores, and it'll follow those. That's why earthworm holes are so beneficial because the earthworm lines its hole with a lot of uh, nutrients that are readily available and, and uh, the roots will just jam pack a uh, earthworm hole and, and go down that hole and they'll suck up a lot of those nutrients, the, the waste from the, from the earthworms. Usually if you have earthworms, that means you're on the, on the path to right. good soil health. If you have a lot of earthworms and you're promoting earthworms and you start getting some uh, a little bit of residue now these these earthworms will take a lot of that residue deep into the soil and kind of mix it in uh, and you got to feed got to feed your livestock so guys have, have had problems where they've had so many earthworms that they just pull all the residue down and then they leave that that top bare but you know those are things that we just have to work through and that's where you put in a lot of different diversity of different cover crops some of the earthworms would like kind of like uh, certain uh, residue a little bit better than others. If you get big, really big chunks, they can't pull it into the soil, and that will kind of armor your soil so that you won't have soil erosion. Okay, we yeah. want to keep that soil have a lot of different residue there. Most of the residue in healthy soils is breaking down very quickly. We're getting a very high turnover. If you're in a soil in a field and, and your residue is not breaking down, chances are maybe you're using too many fungicides. You're killing off the fungus that help to break that down, or uh, you just don't have the soil healthy there yet, and uh, that then that can create some problems. So you, you really need to look at your program. What are you doing wrong uh, that your residue, if your residue is not breaking down, it could be you got compacted layers, could be the chemicals you're using. There's a lot of different things that you just have to look at, try to figure out what's causing that problem. Have you, in your research, come across this? When a, when a root dies at the end of the season, it obviously remains in the ground. Mm -hmm. And it goes away. It breaks down and decomposes. Is it more like if I put my fist into the sand, when I pull my hand out of the sand, the hole collapses versus let's say I have packable snow that you could make a snow out of. If I punch my hand into mm -hmm. that snow, pull my hand out, the snow is going to retain the shape of my hand. The sand won't. When mm -hmm. those roots break down, are they leaving an open cavity there? in their place or do you find that when the roots die off there is some kind of collapse there all the, but it's not sealing itself shut that's a good question um i really haven't thought about that too much but m my suspicion would be that uh, as the microbes start to break down these roots 
they're going to leave a lot of their waste behind. You know, they're going to process it. And it's a slow process. I mean, you might have some big chunks. You might have some little chunks. It's going to decompose at different rates. Uh, and, and so you're going to get some big chunks, little chunks, but you're going to have a lot of microbial waste. And those are kind of the glues and the sugars that are in the soil that causes soil to be sticky. OK, and, and gives it its what, what's happening in a macro aggregate is you're taking all the micro aggregates. The root goes down and as the root penetrates into the soil, it's lining up all these real small soil particles and it's actually compacting the soil. People didn't realize this, but but roots actually compact the soil, but they do it with a purpose. So what they're doing is they're lining up these uh, uh, particles of soil and then they're enveloping them with uh, some of the, the root exudates, and uh, they're uh, forming what we call macro aggregates, and then the microbial waste. And then pretty soon what you get is this little ped that will crumble, and that's what we call good soil structure. When you can go into a soil and you look at it, those macro aggregates, the soil just crumbles on it, on you. Those are macro aggregates. When you go into a soil that's been heavily tilled and it's just one solid mass, that's really just a bunch of very, very small micro aggregates that are all cemented together like bricks in a house. Those are your micro aggregates, the bricks would be. They're all cemented together and it's just one big chunk that's so dense that the roots can't get through it. So there's a lot of things going on uh, throughout your soil. Everything is a micro environment. You can have just a couple millimeters away um, uh, totally different soil conditions. One can be totally saturated, just a little bit away. The pH can be at one level, just a couple millimeters away. The pH can totally change and uh, it can be aerated. And, and uh, that's why we always talk about soil on a micro uh, view. Everything is, is uh, uh, in a very, very, it changes so much within the soil. There really is no such thing as a uniform soil conditions because it's, it's so variable throughout the field. And we like to just combine everything together and take kind of an average, but there really isn't a thing called averages in the soil. It's, it's all over the board, even just within a very, very short distance. And that's actually very good and healthy to have different conditions because as the root's going out there, it can search out different minerals and uh, different conditions and uh, it makes the nutrients available. What's happening in most of our soils is our soils are becoming too compacted. We're getting away from that balance and, and what's happening is we're getting oversaturated soils or, or soils that are just totally compacted and then, then uh, we, we don't have that balance and uh, we've gone too far one way or the other. Then your plants become sick and they just don't grow as well So uh, because they have um, nutrient deficiencies. Right. So what we're trying to do is in a healthy soil, you should have a balance of conditions and uh, not any one condition should uh, uh, be prevalent throughout that. That soil. And that, that, that's actually good. You get more diversity when you have um, a balance. Does that make sense? It does. Hopefully. It does make a lot of sense. And, and thinking of that and thinking back to this idea of, of corn hitting a compaction layer, J-rooting, why, how can cover crops start to break up that compaction? If you have a plant in there that is hitting a mm -hmm. compaction layer and J-rooting, What's changing mm -hmm. when you introduce other plants? Why can they break up? You said corn has larger roots. Is it they have finer roots? Is it different and more microbiology yes. happening that's, that's helping? That's the biggest thing. I, I always talk about the situation where, you know, carpenter, if you think about carpenters, if, if you ever do any carpentry work, uh, if you got to drill a hole, you'll 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 drill a pilot hole first, okay? And that makes it easier for the bigger drill bit to get through. So think of the corn as uh, being a big drill bit, and when it hits a very dense area, it can't get through. But if you have a a cover crop that has a lot of fine, very fine root hairs, they can get in between some of these areas and start to break it up a little bit. And then when the next root comes along, uh, it can follow that same path 
and a lot of the nutrients are going to be there and uh, uh, better gas exchange. And it'll follow that same path, but it's just about like drilling a pilot hole. Right. It makes it a lot easier for that bigger root then to penetrate into that. And over time, it might take two to three years to break up your compaction and soil. Generally, we say cover crop roots can go down about a foot uh, each year year, but there's always going to be areas in a soil that are really, really compacted. And it may only, it might be more, uh, uh, it might be better to think instead of, of uh, how many feet that they go down or inches, it might be better to think of it in percent. Maybe the first year they take out 10 or 20 percent of the compaction. The next year they take out another 20 to 30 percent of the compaction. And then by the, maybe the third year, now we're up to 70, 80 percent of the, the total soil is is less compacted and the roots can get through there. And then after, you know, four, five, six, seven years, that soil just literally crumbles and you can't find any compacted layers whatsoever. So it takes time. It's probably better to think of soil structure and soil compaction in percentages, how much compaction we can take out versus in depth. Because most of the time, the compaction, uh, the poor soil structure is at certain levels in the soil, and we're trying to get through that. And maybe the first year, we only take out 10% or 20%. It's hard to say. I've not done any studies on this. But just visualizing it and thinking about it as you add more roots, the next year, you're going to start to spread out, and you're going to start to break up more of that soil. And by the third, fourth, fifth year, you're just every year, you're making that soil a little bit better place and a little bit easier to get through. And pretty soon that soil starts to crumble. It smells better. You got more biological life and uh, then it's going to start to perform. Most of our problems in no-till start with soil compaction. Until you get your soil to be healthy, uh, uh, you got to get rid of the compaction. You've got to get good soil structure. And until that happens, you're going to struggle to make no-till corn, soybeans, whatever crop you're trying to raise. You're going to have a hard time making that successful to you get better soil structure. And so, that may take a couple of years, one, two, three, right. four, five. It just depends on how bad it is. So do you typically see a, a yield drop where somebody's producing at a high level pre-no-till and then they go and start to transition no-till, maybe yield drops, their soil structure improves, and then it it starts getting back up there and creeping mm -hmm. back up? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. A lot of it has to do with nitrogen, okay? So when you have poor soil structure, and I always like to think of, uh, let, let's think of any natural disaster, okay? And, and really tillage is a, a natural disaster, okay? So the one I always think about, and I'm a little older than most people, I, you know, maybe Katrina, a lot of people can remember the big uh, hurricane that happened down in New Orleans. Let me ask you a question. What was the worst day? Was it the worst day for the people that were down there, the actual day that the hurricane hit? Well, most people found shelter, but then what happened? All of a sudden, the lights went out and the floodgates didn't work and the area started to flood and people started to get away. But what was the absolute worst time? Probably about four, three, four, five weeks after the actual hurricane because things were so bad that help couldn't get in there to make it better. So the worst time in a natural disaster isn't when you when the hurricane actually hit, which is tillage, okay? It actually takes a period of time. Things are going to get worse before they get better. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's exactly what's happening in our soils. If you're going to make your soils heal, you got to figure out what's wrong and and the big thing is the compaction is the biggest problem. When you have compaction, you're going to get more denitrification. You're going to have less nitrogen, okay? And and because you have less nitrogen, your yields start to go down, okay? Until you break that compacted layer up, uh, that's going to be a problem. The other thing is you've got to change your microbial community, and that takes a little bit of time. It can take you one, two, three years to change that microbial community. In a conventional tilled system, it's dominated by bacteria. Bacteria live six hours, you know, maybe a couple days at the most, okay? Fungi live 
many, many years. And it can take a couple years to build those populations back up, okay? So that's why we see that dip until you start to make the transition. And then the other thing is you got to get the air, uh, you got to get the pore space back in there so that you can get the carbon and all the nutrients to recycle and you got to get the right biology. So there's a lot going on with no-till. That's why we typically see that two to three, sometimes up to a five to seven year dip. Now, the best way to make that go quicker is to add cover crops, go with a multi-species cover crop the first year, or even better yet, put it into a hay crop where you already have the biology and you've already kind of broken that soil up. It's a lot easier to go into no-till, say into a perennial crop like hay or a pasture or CRP, Conservation Reserve Program, you can make that transition a lot quicker. The hardest place, and this is what 90, 95% of the people do, is they try to do it on a corn soybean rotation. Just adding wheat one year, and after the wheat, putting in a multi-species cover crop will greatly increase your chances for success for no-till the next year, okay? You, you gotta heal the soil, and we gotta find ways to heal it quicker and any any way that you can add more carbon back into that soil and get those root exudates and that microbial poop and that all that active carbon uh, in the soil to, to heal the soil uh, that's going to make your soils uh, perform better but it can take you know one two three years sometimes if you're really going slow and you're doing corn after soybeans and you didn't get rid of the compaction it can take seven to nine years to make that transition but I just told you a whole lot of things you can do to speed this thing up. Manure is just really, really great. Uh, we're mimicking the, the the bison, the buffalo. So adding some manure and getting more roots and, and healthier plants out there can really restore a soil fairly quickly. Uh, you'll get twice as many roots, twice as much biomass uh, if you uh, fertilize your cover crops with with some manure. And uh, so it can just really help to speed up the process a little bit. How do you, Does that make sense? It Hopefully. makes a lot of sense. And if you think about manure on a smaller scale, people add compost. How do you view building soil yeah. from the top down versus the bottom up? The bottom up approach is we're going to put a bunch of roots in there, get the carbon pump going, mm -hmm. feed the biology. The top down approach is right. we're going to either bring in grazing animals, we're going to apply manure, we're going to apply compost. How do you view those two mm -hmm. as how they build organic matter? Complementary. Yeah. Absolutely complementary. Um, uh, if you can add grazing animals, that's the optimal uh, because now you've got the urine, you got the feces, um, you're you're physically, you know, you're maybe doing some disturbance on the top, but you're getting a lot of root turnover. Every time that cow uh, or sheep goes down to graze, uh, what happens is uh, the uh, you've got more root growth than you do top growth. So those roots have, you know, those roots are going to die back until they can support that plant. Now, that's why you don't want to overgraze it. If you overgraze it, well, then it can take a long, long period of time. But if you just keep nibbling on the top and, and you know, it used to be take 50 percent, leave 50 percent. Now they're saying take maybe a third, leave two thirds is, is more common. Um, but if you do that, what happens is you're going to get root turnover. It's going to die back just a little bit. And then as it regrows, it's going to put out new roots. Well, all those roots that died is adding carbon to your soil. And that's how you can build up your soil very, very quickly by doing the grazing. You're, you're complementing what's going on below ground with what's going on above ground. Uh, other things, compost is very good. Right now there's char are all things that have a lot of carbon in it. Uh, worm castings are very, very high in nutrients and uh, are, are extremely good at uh, loosening the soil and, and really promoting uh, uh, plant growth. So any, any way that you can improve plant growth, uh, again, what you get above ground on average is what you get below ground. Yeah. And so letting that plant and not overgrazing it, letting it grow out and getting a little more height and then cutting it back and then letting it grow again and cutting it back a little bit uh, will we'll get you more root turnover. Uh, where, where we have a problem, it's, it's interesting. Just go to a golf course, you know, and, and on those fast screens, what do they do? 
they cut that grass right down almost. I mean, there's hardly anything sticking out above ground. Well, if you dig in that, you'll find that it's really, really hard. That ground is hard because there's hardly any roots there. Now, you let that grass grow out, say, an inch, and you go look below the ground soil, and you're going to find that there's a lot more roots. If you let that grass grow out two, three, four inches, well, all of a sudden now you're going to have a lot better root structure or soil structure and a lot more roots there simply because you're letting it grow. You're putting in more carbon in your end. And when you graze it or you mow it, uh, we can simulate grazing by doing that, by mowing. You can you can uh, change the way your soil is going to perform just by the, the height and how often and the frequency that you mow. We're very closely mimicking what the cows and the sheep and the deer and the elk and the buffalo did, yeah. okay? And uh, we can simulate that. Yeah, and in a system like that, or we're adding manure, we're adding compost, but we're not tilling. How mm -hmm. do you see that organic matter getting right. introduced into the soil profile? Is the soil profile just raising up, like that layer now becomes the new soil surface as the the soil merges uh, up into you it. Let the, you let the critters do the tillage. Just yeah. let the critters do the tillage in a healthy soil. OK, you can go out there and there'll be black ground beetles and ants and uh, all kinds of biological life. Sow bugs and pill bugs, whatever you want to call them. Earthworms. You know, you got a many different types of earthworms. Uh, even the voles and groundhogs, although, you know, we don't typically want groundhogs out there. We want to try to keep the voles down. This is a year where here in the Midwest, the voles are starting to increase, okay? But all that wildlife, all the, the biological life in the soil, they will mix the soil. An earthworm will turn over, um, what they say? It's it's something like every 10 years, they'll turn over the top six inches. They're They're almost like a plow. Uh, incorporating the residue, especially your our night crawlers, you know, bringing down. So you really don't have to incorporate it. Uh, the the wildlife in the soil, the biology will do it for you if you have a healthy soil. Uh, um, where we run into problems is where we over apply manure, and maybe some of the manure is you know, we put it on at very high rates, and it may be a little toxic. And then if it kills all the biological life in the soil, if it's just a little too hot, uh, some of these rations can get really hot. If you put on too much, you can actually burn everything off. So light rates, you got to think like the buffalo. The buffalo would move around, they would graze, and they would deposit their manure and go away for a couple months and then come back and regraze again. And uh you know, think about about what the buffalo did is they spread their manure thin uh, and, and that would be incorporated into the soil and would fertilize the plants and then they would come back and regraze it again. OK, so that's that's really what we need to do. But, you know, getting there can be a little bit difficult when you have degraded your soils as much as we have can take a little bit of time uh, to get that soil life back in there uh, again. So, sure. um, you know, you just have to be a little patient or, you know, you can do things like, you know, doing multi-species cover crops helps. Uh, mowing maybe a little bit, harvesting, grazing is really going to help. That will speed it up faster than there, anything else that you can do. Uh, but if you can't graze it, maybe you can mow it at a couple different heights and things like that uh, different times to try to get some more root turnover. Right. It really works well with sorghum sedan. I, I love sorghum sedan. Sorghum sedan will probably add more carbon to your soil than any other species. Uh Sorghum is related to uh, the corn. You let it grow about three, four feet tall, mow it off high, maybe eight to 12 inches high, so it'll grow back fast. When sorghum gets mowed off, it'll add five to 10 times more roots. And it's all about root turnover. You can add a tremendous amount of carbon to your soils by growing some of these cover crops. And you know, if you can graze it, I don't care if you wanna graze it, or bale it off and feed it to cattle or sheep or whatever you have, that's fine because I'm after what's going on below the ground. I would just say this at the end of the year, just make sure you leave a little bit of residue there so that we don't have soil erosion. Don't take it all, leave that armor on top of the soil so that we protect the soil from soil erosion. Right, and mowing is, is one form of grazing. For people that might not have access to grazing animals or want the grazing animals, you're obviously losing the benefits of the animal byproducts, the saliva, the feces, the urine, 
but you are performing that effect of taking mm -hmm. the plant, stopping growth, forcing it to regrow, and then you're taking all that above ground biomass and you're mm -hmm. at least dropping that on the soil surface. Right, right. Okay. And most of our organic matter comes from the roots. 80, 85% of the soil organic matter is actually a root. What the residue does on the surface is protects the soil from rainfall impact generally. And uh, what it does, I mean, some of this rain coming down on a hard rain, it can reach 30 mile per hour. And I like to talk about this because I think this is really important. What do you think the average soil erosion rate is in the United States? The average soil erosion rate across the whole United States is 7.6 tons per acre. Now, most people can't visualize a ton, so let's break it down into pounds. If you take that times 2,000, that's 15,200 pounds of, of soil that erodes off of on average off of every acre of land. Now, some soils will be two, some will be 15, okay? Let's think about what the average soybean yield is in the United States, 50 bushel. 50 times 60 pounds per bushel is 3,000. And here's a, a startling statistic. On average in the United States, for every one pound of soybeans that we produce, we're losing five pounds of topsoil. Crazy. Is that sustainable? Crazy. It's not. It's not sustainable. And even when you do the numbers for corn, just simply because we have more biomass, on average, we're losing about 1.5 to 1.7, 1.8 pounds of topsoil for every one pound of, cor of, uh, of uh, corn that we produce. Okay, so even on corn, it's not sustainable. Uh, we need to get that down. Uh, the average soil is only going to add... Uh, about a thousand pounds of topsoil. And everybody will say, well, how do you add topsoil? Well, think about what soil is made of. It's made out of rocks, right? Ground up rocks. So on average, the, the rocks in the soil will decompose or break down into sand, silt, and clay at about a thousand pounds. It's just an average number, about a thousand pounds a year. That's, that's a half a ton. So if we want to be sustainable, if we want to talk, you know, this idea that we can lose uh, four to five ton uh, an acre and be sustainable, uh, NRCS came up with that years ago. Well, that's nowhere close. We need to be losing less than a thousand pounds of topsoil. That's less than a half a ton per acre in order to be sustainable. And, and I often ask this question, is it, should we try to get soil erosion down to zero? And the answer is no, that's not even natural either because the fish and the, the wildlife in the water do need some nutrients. So maybe two, 300, 500 pounds Loss is is a sustainable level. Just as long as we're not losing over a thousand pounds, we want to be below a thousand pounds. I don't know what the the absolute you know the best level would be, but you do have to have a little bit. And we're never going to get it down to the point where we don't have some erosion. Right. So it's not something we probably really need to worry about. But a lot of people think that all erosion is bad. No, it's a balance. Okay, a little bit of erosion is okay, uh, but it's a very little, very little erosion. We don't want a lot. And right now we're, we're way over out of whack on, on soil erosion in the United States. If we would just concentrate on soil erosion and minimizing soil erosion, we would fix so many problems. Because in order to fix soil erosion, we would have to improve soil health and uh, we would make nutrient uh, availability better. And we would have a lot less uh, water pollution and uh, nutrient runoff. Uh, if we just concentrated on soil erosion again, I think we would get there quicker than thinking about making this too complicated and thinking about water quality and trying to improve it. Just concentrate on, on the big thing, soil erosion. And the things that fix soil erosion are the same thing that's gonna fix your nutrient recycling, less fertilizer needs, and uh, you'll have a lot less nutrient runoff. Sometimes we make things just a little too complicated. That's what we do as people. You know, it's a human thing. You know, if you think about a thousand yes. pounds of acre in a great system where somebody's doing, quote, everything right, how much topsoil do you think you could produce per acre per year? Okay, so the, the average number is about a thousand pounds. That's mainly the mineral portion. But when we're really talking about the portion that we really want to enhance in the soil is, is the uh, organic matter. So where we're doing multi-species cover crops, 
uh, we can get 20, 30, even up to 50, uh, 40, maybe as much as 50,000 pounds of residue. The, the problem with that is most of that is going to decompose and go up into the uh, atmosphere. So we only we only keep maybe uh, in, in the Midwest, uh, we're losing anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of that. So let's just say 75 percent is lost. That means a quarter of whatever we're we're putting above ground is is what we're going to add to uh, uh, to our soil. So generally, what we get above ground, we get below ground. So you can kind of do the the numbers on your own and see how much you can add to your soil. And it's going to vary by region a little bit. The more humid you are, uh, and uh, the more the higher the temperature, the faster you lose organic matter. As you go north, it's interesting. The soils at the equator have the least amount of organic matter. As you go further and further north, soils have more and more organic matter. And it all comes down to climate. When it's cold and when it's drier, as you get closer and closer to uh, uh, the, the Arctic Circle, it tends to get colder and drier and uh, you you uh, keep the, uh, the organic matter there. Or if it does, um, if it is saturated, it's going to freeze and uh, you're not going to have that uh, that breakdown. So it really depends on where you're located geographically. It depends on the climate, but it also depends on how much residue you're putting out there. So we can manipulate the residue and by growing multi-species cover crops, it's it's possible to add. You know, I've talked to Dave Brandt and his soils were down to about 2% here in Ohio. And he has some fields that are now uh, 8% organic matter. He's done that in about a 20, 30 year time period, but he really worked at it. In some fields, he really went overboard trying to get more and more organic matter there. And it is possible to uh, to manipulate the system to do that. So, Is there an upper limit of where you think organic matter, you start to lose value in it? Like there's something wrong with the soil if organic matter keeps going up, it's not breaking it down. I've heard this statement, <laughs> the whole point of organic yeah. matter is to lose it. What do you think about that? Uh, I haven't seen an upper limit yet, and it's going to take you a long time to get there. So I really wouldn't worry about it. But let's just take an example. Our muck soils, you know, they're, they can be 30 to 50 percent organic matter. They produce really good crops, but they have to be drained. In the process of draining them, what happens? We oxidize them and they burn up. It's just like putting wood in a stove. When you open that damper up and you put the oxygen in there, you're going to burn that carbon up. Well, in that carbon is a lot of nutrients and they can be extremely productive. So instead of thinking about uh, trying to reach what I would call uh, high, really high levels of organic matter, I would think about organic matter turnover. That's what's more important. So let me give you a, a real quick example. Let's think about a, a really good sandy, loamy soil that has 1% to 2% organic matter, okay? And then let's compare that to, let's say, a, a heavy clay loam soil that has, let's say, 5%, um, 6% organic matter. Can I produce 200, 300 bushel corn on both of those? The answer is yes, but what's the difference? The difference on the one to 2% organic matter is we have very fast carbon turnover and it, the corn's gonna grow quickly, but we're gonna get fast carbon turnover. We need to keep replacing that carbon. You know, We don't wanna get it down too low. If you get it down like a half a percent, that's that's gonna become like blow sand. You know, it's just not gonna do very well. But if you have a, a pretty good sandy soil that has you know two, 3% organic matter, that can produce just as well as, as a four, five, 6% uh, clay soil. Now the clay soil, the organic matters, very high, but it's turning over much slower, okay? So it's not so much, it's really about uh, a combination of organic accumulation, but it's also about uh, organic turnover that's really important. Both systems, we can get good crops, okay? You just have to know that in a sandy soil, it may, you're never going to get, it's going to be very hard to get five, six, eight percent organic matter on a sandy soil just because it's of the porosity that is there. There's a lot of oxygen there. But 
that doesn't mean you can't raise good crops. Uh, you know, what a uh, good organic matter level on a sandy soil is going to be a lot different than a good organic matter on a clay soil. So got to understand those differences. And it's really about organic matter turnover that, that uh, we're looking at and when those nutrients are available. Both systems can be, you know, can be uh, do quite well for us. Does that kind of make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And, and hopefully one, I keep asking you that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm following along with you. So you're doing a great job of explaining it. And if you think about building organic matter, one way to do that is to keep that living root in the soil. You've talked a lot about multi-species Absolutely. cover crop. If somebody, to try and keep it as universal as possible, I know you're in Ohio, but to try and keep it geographically mm-hmm. as universal as possible, how should somebody think about putting together a multi-species cover crop blend for their land if they're looking to, if they're in a no-till system, they're looking to improve the quality of the soil, sure. build topsoil, build organic matter? So so what we're, we need to think about when in a multi-species mix is we want that diversity. So there's, there's a couple different types of cover crops that we want to think about as a group. So you have your warm season cover crops. It kind of depends on the time of the year. Warm season cover crops are crops that are going to be grown in the summer. They're going to die with the first frost. So if you uh, are planting them in the fall, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to plant a warm season. But if you've got, say, after wheat or, uh, you know, uh, you can put uh, have a long growing season and you, you can put in a, a warm season cover crop, try to do a mixture of warm season with cool season. Cool seasons are the ones that will survive the winter and will survive a frost. And so you try to do a mixture. So that's one way of looking at it. We also like to see diversity in legumes or clovers that are going to add nitrogen. They typically tend to have more tap roots uh, versus grasses, which have finer roots and are going to add more carbon. So your legumes will add a little more nitrogen. Your grasses are going to add more carbon. And we want to have a balance of those. And then we want to throw in maybe a couple brassicas, uh, and these can be warm and cool season, just depending on your growing season. And then there might be some what we call other ones, you know, things like buckwheat and sunflower. They can make really great pollinators to help us with soil health. And so you try to get a diversity uh, of different plants. You know, some people have experimented up, up to, you know, 15 or 20 different species. I would maybe when you're starting, it can be a little more, more difficult. You might start off with, you know, say three to five. And then if you're comfortable with that, try to go to seven to eight to 10. And then, you know, you can go wherever you want. But just remember, seed cost does become an issue as you add more and more species. Some of these cost a lot more. Uh, try to put in some of the species that are both small seeded because they tend to be quite a bit cheaper. And um, uh, if you put those in, you only need maybe a quarter to a half a pound, and they might only be just a couple bucks versus putting something that's really expensive. You know, if you're getting up five, seven, ten dollars a pound, why it can get pretty expensive. I've seen cover crop mixes cost as little as you know ten to twelve dollars to as much as a hundred dollars an acre. And it's a lot harder to make that hundred dollars an acre pay for itself. So, so there, there's a happy mix. Usually, twenty to twenty-five dollars an acre is what I try to stick with. Most people will go that if I can go a little bit cheaper in tough times, maybe go just a little cheaper and put in something that doesn't cost quite as much. And uh, uh, anything that has a live root is going to help you uh, generally. Um, now, you don't want to have weeds. The only reason I say that is uh, if they go to seed, why then then you're going to be fighting your weeds. So try to find something that's a little easier to kill and maybe a little cheaper and can give you most of the benefits, give you the most benefits possible. What if somebody was just fighting compaction and they weren't beholden to any sort of crop rotation? Like mm-hmm. they, in a perfect world, they could take a few years off and just solve their compaction issues. Mm-hmm. Is there a species mix that you'd look at for really taking on compaction? Probably the best uh, ones are some of the grasses really do a good job. Sorghum sedan is one of the best uh, compaction. Uh, Annual rye grass. um, Cereal rye does pretty good, and so does oats. And and kind of in that about that order, those would be the ones on the grasses. On the brassicas, uh, there's nothing probably better than the tillage radish or the, you know, the, the daikon radish. I just said tillage is a, a species, is a particular variety, whereas daikon is, is a species. So we're looking for the white radish, the daikon radish, and there's several 
all different um, different variety, you know, guys are selling different ones out there. Different companies have uh, different uh, uh, different uh, varieties of that. So uh, the Daycon is really good. A uh, sunflower is really deep rooted. That can be a good one. Buckwheat is really shallow rooted. So if you have shallow compaction, go with buckwheat and phacelia. If you have really deep compaction and you're trying to break it up, go with something like alfalfa and uh, uh, your sunflower are all very deep roots. So it kind of really depends on what your situation is. And, and even better is if you can graze it or utilize that as a forage, well, then that helps to, to pay for that cover crop. You know, with something like a sorghum sedan grass, it can grow to be huge and 10 feet tall in the right yes. climate. Yeah. How, how, what do you mm-hmm. get? You probably hear this all the time of reconciling the nutrient use versus the benefit. Oh, that big plant, it's going to take all that biomass. It's got to produce it. It's going to take all the nutrients out of the soil to make that biomass. Am I not creating this problem mm-hmm. where now I'm going to have to over amend to, to put all that stuff back? Uh, it, it depends on what you're doing with it. If you're not harvesting it, all you're doing is bringing nutrients to the soil surface, and then the biology will pull it deeper back into the soil and recycle it, okay? Now, if you're harvesting it and you're going to take it off, well, hopefully, if you're going to take it off, then you've got the manure as a byproduct that you can put it back. Now, if you go to sell it, that's where you've got a problem. Um, then then you can, but in some places that can actually be a strategy. So we have areas that have extremely high phosphorus, excess nutrients, water quality issues. We can use sorghum sedan as a crop that we can harvest multiple times, maybe three, four cuttings a year, and take that almost off like alfalfa hay, feed it to cattle, but we're going to ship it maybe 100, 200 miles away, away from a, uh, a water, you know, an area where we have water quality, and we can actually start to lower the nutrients in the soil. So you got to use it to your advantage is what I'm saying. And sure. uh, if you're, as long as you're keeping that on the soil and you're putting the manure back, it's not really a big issue. We're kind of mimicking those buffalo uh, and uh, the buffalo and the bison there, they, they had a real nice cycle going on. And uh, the crops grew really well, and and uh, we we just kept improving the soil every year. Carbon is our limiting element in the soil, so that's the one we need to give. So I can tell you a real quick story about carbon. So let's say um, um, you're trying to grow 200 bushel corn. How much carbon do you need on a daily basis to grow 200 bushel corn? Have you ever thought about that? Well, you need about 100 pounds. Where does that carbon come from? Well, most most of us have been taught it comes from the atmosphere, but if you would all come just from the atmosphere and no place else, you would need an area of about 32 to 33 cubic acres of air to get 100 pounds of carbon out of the atmosphere. So when we start to think about this, where is the carbon coming from? It's actually coming from the roots. Okay, the the concentration in the atmosphere is around 400 to 410 parts per million. The concentration of carbon in the root zone is about 3,000 to 10,000 parts per million. So let's think about this just a little bit. Okay, so um, what do leaves take in? They're taking in carbon dioxide and they're giving off oxygen, right? What do the roots take in? Roots take in oxygen and they're giving off carbon dioxide. And it even gets a little bit better. As we get the the lower night temperatures, we can raise that carbon concentration in that soil up from about three to 10,000 up to maybe 20, 30, 40,000 parts per million at daybreak. And then let's think about photosynthesis. How effective are we on photosynthesis? Do you realize that within about the first one, two hours at the most, We've used up all of our carbon dioxide reserves in that soil within just a just a very short period of time. We're only about 10 to 20 percent efficient at photosynthesis, and it's all due to a lack of carbon dioxide in the soil. We used to have 60, uh, you know, six to eight percent organic matter. We've lost 60 to 80 percent of our carbon from our soils. We're now down to on average probably two two and a half, three percent organic matter. 
And, and just think about this. Have you ever seen uh, a farmer, you know, plow a fence row or, or plow a, um, a pasture? What happens to that corn? You can see right to the row where that organic matter is because of the higher organic matter. That corn will be two, three feet taller and have much bigger ears. OK, it's all due to the amount of carbon, the nitrogen and the phosphorus and the biological life that's in that soil that's healthy. And so if we can get back to that, what I tell everybody, rather than bringing our fence rows down to the level of our cultivated fields, we need to take our cultivated fields and through no till and cover crops and by improving soil health, bring it up to what the level of the. Uh, is in that uh, that fence row. That's the goal that we're trying to do. We're trying to get our soils from being degraded, getting them back to being healthy again. And most of our yeah. soils in the world are now degraded, extremely degraded. The only way you'll know is to go out to a fence row, an area that's non-disturbed, and just compare what you see there to what you see in the field, and you'll see big differences. It doesn't take a, a trained scientist to see that uh, when you start digging in the soil a little bit, you can see these differences quite easily. It'll pop right out at you what, what you're looking at. And uh, uh, you might need somebody to help you explain what's going on, and I can do that, but but uh, other people can do that also. So just to make sure I'm following this right, you have the roots taking mm -hmm. in oxygen, they're putting out CO2. That CO2 mm -hmm. is then being absorbed right. above ground by the leaves, which is helping the plants... Mm -hmm photosynthesize if there's a shortage right of co2 or carbon dioxide right. yeah under the ground then photosynthesis mm -hmm. above ground suffers how do you get more mm -hmm. carbon dioxide production underground if that's root dependent the roots need more oxygen so so what's happening underground to mm -hmm. get the roots more oxygen so they can off gas the co2 well uh, actually, the roots will uncompact your soil and create the porosity to allow that. Roots actually like, like act like a biological valve to let oxygen into the soil. It's only when we do tillage and we create these compacted zones that we get really hard soils. There is a really good uh, soil to gas uh, water exchange in the soil, okay, when you have good soil structure. But when you when you take that carbon out of the soil and you put it up in the atmosphere, and you got to realize we have a tremendous amount of carbon in the atmosphere because it, it can go up, you know, I think our atmosphere goes up almost 100 miles. So what we can do is we're, we're pulling that carbon back down that's up in the atmosphere and we're going to lower it back down. You know, if you go uh, uh, back in time, the carbon dioxide level was both much higher and much lower, but, you know, probably pre-industrial period, you know, before the 1800s, we were down around 250 uh, parts per million on, on uh, carbon. So we have a tremendous ability through cover crops and even forested areas and things like that. We can pull a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere and we can put it back into ground. The, the soil is the best area for storage. What What's our biggest storage area for carbon right now? So I, I kind of should probably finish my story. So we're talking about this carbon, and let's, let's think about this. Where are the stomata on a corn leaf? Have you ever looked at that? They're underneath the leaves. So in the spring, you know, let's say we plant this crop, but let's say before we plant it, we till it. What happens when we till it? All that carbon dioxide, let's say we till it in the fall and then we till it again in the spring. What happens when we do all the tillage? What happens to all that carbon dioxide? Goes way up into the atmosphere, the trade winds take it, and where does it end up? What's the biggest uh, sink for carbon in the world? The ocean, okay? A lot of the carbon ends up in the ocean. Now let's think about this. When you're breaking up that carbon in the soil, what are you doing? You're releasing nitrogen, you're releasing phosphorus. And what happens when it rains? The nitrogen and the phosphorus wash off, get into our rivers and streams, and where does that end up? Ends up in the ocean. We have a broken carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus cycle, and that's having an impact on the water cycle also, and it all goes back to the way we're farming currently. If you think about the buffalo, what did they do? We had grass growing year-round, 
uh, and forbs and everything else, wildflowers, and they're recycling their nutrients. They're eating it. They graze. And every time they, you know, they poof, they defecate, you know, they urinate, they're refertilizing that grass. And we have a complete carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus cycle, and the nutrients didn't get into the, uh, into the stream. So it worked out really well. So, okay. so, so it's the organic matter that's being stored under the soil surface that gets broken down yeah, by the ass. microbiology into CO2 that floats up in the air. The stomata then are right. absorbing that. So you're bank, you're basically, when you put organic matter right. in there, you're really banking CO2 that you're going to need later. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah. And. In, in thinking about that, I mean, it's a lot to think about it. <laughs> it is. It's a complicated yeah. thing. I, and I think I saw in one of your presentations, you you mentioned something along the lines of plants produce 40 percent more sugars than they actually need to sustain their own plant right. growth. And that's going into the soil to right. feed the biology. Right. And uh, plants are actually figured out it's cheaper for them to feed the microbes and have the microbes feed them than they could by themselves. That's how plants and the microbes kind of evolved together. And uh, what what the, the plants figured out is that they were very good at photosynthesis. And, and we have a tremendous, we're only 15 to 20% efficient. So uh, uh, let's think about corn. What is the optimal, what's the, the, I shouldn't say optimal, but what's the highest level of corn production that could be possible? The, the scientists have looked at this and said, we could produce 1,100 bushels of corn per acre. What's our current level? Let's just say we average 200, and a lot of places don't. Maybe it's 150, 200, but 200 is an easy number. We're only roughly 20% efficient at, at photosynthesis. In order to get 1,100, everything would have to be absolutely perfect, and we'll probably not reach that level on average, but is it possible to reach four, five, six, even 700 bushel? It could be if we were to improve the soil enough and, and to uh, get it back to where it was. You would almost have to go back to maybe having those uh, uh, those virgin type soils. And that's kind of what we're doing with the cover crops and soil health is we're restoring our soils. Very, very uh, easy to think about this. Think about Brazil, okay? Brazil has what we call oxisol soils. These are worn out soils. They, they have a lot of rainfall, you know, 60 to 80 inches, 120 inches a year. They, they really flushed out a lot of the nutrients out of their soil. And yet today, when we go to Brazil, what are their soybean yields? Well, they're getting 50, 60, 70, even 80 bushel soybeans off of soils that are worn out. How'd they do that? Well, they took the tropics and they, they basically burned up the organic matter in, in the trees. And within about four or five years, their soils would get hard as a rock. And then they started growing cover crops and now what they're finding is they're turning those oxisol soils, worn out soils, and they're becoming more and more like mollusols every year because of the root turnover. OK, they're putting a cover crop, then they grow their next crop and then they grow a cover crop. And sometimes they're even interceding cover crops into their beans. They have now gotten, you know, they were starting out, they were getting 80 bushel corn. Well, now they're going to become one of our biggest competitors on corn. They have now raised their corn yields up to 130, 140, 150, even 160 bushel per acre. They're not that far behind us. And what they've done over the last 30, 40, 50 years is they have transitioned their soils from oxisols into more and more like, like a, a mosul. Now, they're not mosuls yet, uh, but if you look at it, they're adding so much organic matter to their soils and their long-term no-till down there and using extensive cover crops. 80, 90% of their soils now have cover crops and no-till. The guys that will do just uh, do conventional tillage, what they find within four to five years, their soil will get just as hard as a rock. Anything that happens in the tropics happens 10 times faster than what it happens in the temperate zones. What's happening to us? Our soils are becoming compacted. They're becoming like rock. 
it just takes us 10 times longer than what happens in the, but that's been about a 40, 50 year time period. And a lot of farmers are really complaining about how their soils are degrading. If you wanna make your soils better, you gotta use the four soil health principles that we talked about. Uh, basically minimize soil disturbance, maximize live roots, maximize surface residue, and maximize your biodiversity. Those four things, and some people like to add the fifth principle, which is grazing, add livestock. Uh, and if you did those four or five principles, that's the fastest way to improve a soil. Uh, it's it's uh, almost guaranteed to make it better as long as you don't do something in between here to, you know, we can add a lot of chemicals and things like that. We could screw it up, I guess. But but uh, if you just kind of let the system alone, it will heal itself. It's interesting. Uh, we have a lot of CRP land, okay? And think about CRP, Conservation Reserve. So somebody will take their worst field and it's low in soil fertility. It has a lot of compaction. It's eroding. And they'll put it in CRP for 20 years. And I have guys in my area that are looking for that CRP ground. Why is that? Because that soil has healed itself. Now, there's two ways to farm CRP. I'll tell you the, the way that it's typically done. Guys will go in there and they'll start tilling it up. And within four or five years, they'll ruin it. But for four or five years, they'll get tremendous nutrients and tremendous yields. And then they'll they'll restore it back to its degraded condition in about four or five, maybe six, seven, eight years. OK, now what's the smart way to handle it? Now that I've healed it, go and put cover crops back on there, do it in a no-till system. Maybe start with beans for one or two years just to get a little extra nitrogen in there, but then go with a, a corn, bean, soybean rotation, maintain that fertility, keep it in that almost pristine state, and you can get extremely good yields off that. I had guys that are telling me that these fields that were their worst fields are now their best fields because after 15 to 20 years, Mother Nature healed those soils, yeah. okay? So that's kind of what we're trying to do with the whole soil health thing is heal our soils, get them from a degraded state into a very productive and um, um, healthy, healthy soil again. That's what we're trying to do. Do you think the next step in the evolution is a companion planting or an inner planting, having your cash crop grown with oh. cover crops? I see a lot of things that are going on that are very uh, interesting right now. Uh, uh, we can plant, uh, you know, what they do in Brazil. I, I kind of told you half the story, but another way that they do is they plant their corn. And in between the rows, they wait about three to five days, maybe a week, kind of depends on the area. And then they'll plant sun hemp. And the sun hemp will grow with the corn, but it'll be behind the corn. And the corn will uh, tossle and set an ear, and then the sun hemp grows above the corn. Now, the sun hemp is a big legume, and it'll have nodules that are as big as your thumb, okay? And it can put on 200 pounds of nitrogen. They don't fertilize their corn in, in Brazil. They just use the companion cropping, the sun hemp, okay? And what they'll do is uh, they'll let the corn dry down. They'll go through with a real high combine, and they'll harvest the sun hemp and get that as an oil seed, and they can they can uh, use that uh, both for feed and also for another cover crop. But then they'll turn around, come back at a later date, and harvest their corn, and then they'll plant a cover crop uh, until they they uh, uh, plant their next crop, which is either soybeans or maybe they go back to corn again. Kind of depends on the area, but that's kind of a nice system. Okay, we can do the same thing up here, but we have a little bit grow shorter growing season. So what some people are doing is they're interseeding cover crops. Generally, what we're seeing is guys are starting to widen their rows out. I see a lot of twin row corn now starting to be experimented with, where they'll have 60 inch rows, and some guys are planting their corn really thick there, but they're getting more sunlight in there. And if they've got a flex ear on that, a variety, they can actually get bigger ears and get the same yield, same amount of corn and just as good, maybe even better yields. But now they've got this wide area there that they can put a cover crop and that cover crop can grow real well. And some of them are even introducing sheep, 
or or something like that that they'll graze at. I've had some where I've looked at these fields and the corn is so close together it almost looks like uh, jail bars. Okay, the sheep would have to go all the way to the end to get through there unless they're going to knock down the corn. So there's some things like that that are starting to go on that I think are uh, really interesting. That um, you know uh, I think is going to help us with this. This companion cropping. We, we do some of that. Uh, we uh, let your corn get up, grow with a little bit shorter maturity in corn, and you can fly on or use a high boy and get your cover crops. Kind of that's more of an interseeding type option. Late, say about right now in August and early September, we can put on the cover crop and uh, kind of get one started and always have a live crop out there year round. That would be the absolute goal. So there's a lot of different ways to go with this. Some of them are using, I see some research going on on uh, Cura Clover. Guys are actually putting a, a crop down and they'll stunt that clover a little bit and they'll plant their corn into it and that's supplying their nitrogen. And then as the temperatures get a little cooler and the corn's drying down, sunlight comes out, the, the Cura Clover grows the best in the spring and in the fall. And then uh, uh, the next year they'll go right back to corn and uh, they'll let the cure clover uh, grow through the winter and then they'll plant another crop. So I think there's a lot of different ways to, to slice this and, and try a lot of different things. Sure. So. Yeah, a lot of innovation out there. And what have you seen in systems right. that have really healthy soil in terms of plant health, pest resistance? Do you notice a correlation between soil mm -hmm. health and plant health? That's something that a lot of people claim. Oh, absolutely. There's mixed feelings. What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, where you have healthy soils, one of the reasons, uh, one of the things that uh, I, I've studied some is uh, uh, pest supp suppression. Um, most insects go after unhealthy plants. And unfortunately, when you raise crops on degraded soils, do you think you get healthy plants? Well, you, you get incomplete photosynthesis. And when you have incomplete photosynthesis, you get a lot of nitrates in your plants and you don't get full protein synthesis. Uh, insects love nitrates. And when they sense that a plant is unhealthy, they'll attack it. And that's why most, a lot of our plants, since they're unhealthy, the insects, we see a lot of insects. But if you have a healthy plant, the insects can sense that, that you have full protein synthesis, you'll have higher protein content, you'll have higher test weights, You'll have more dense food, and and the insects will leave that alone because they cannot digest the the uh, amino acids and the full proteins in there as well as they can the nitrates. So a lot of our our plants, even though maybe we're getting pretty good yields, uh, the 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 nutrient density is a lot lower. The the protein content is lower. We've kind of uh, assume that high yields, uh, all, all crops are the same and that the yields are all the same. But really, we should be talking yield-wise, we should be thinking about total pounds of protein uh, versus uh, just yields. Uh, yield is, is one of those things that, you know, I can have 300 bushel corn, and let's just say it has five 5%, let's keep the numbers even, 5% uh, uh, crude protein, okay? Well, uh, let's compare that to say 200 bushel corn, or let's just make, yeah, say 200 bushel corn. What if I had 200 bushel corn? And just to make the, the math easy, it generally it'd be maybe eight, nine percent, but let's just say it's 10 percent. Take 20, 200 uh, bushel times 10 to 10 percent crude protein, and then take 300 uh, times. 5% uh, crude protein. You can see that the 200 bushel corn actually has more protein in it. And if you feed that to a, ca a cattle or to a hog or to a chicken, they will eat all of the high density food uh, that is, and it's probably more complete and it's going to be healthier for them. They'll eat all that first before they'll eat the low density. So we really ought to be talking about nutrient density and even human health. They're all related. A lot of these, you know, if you look over the last 
40, 50 years, there's a much higher incidence. Uh, I happen to be diabetic. So diabetic, autism, all these diseases, yes, yields have gone up in the United States, but with that has come less nutrient density. And some of this could be related to human health, some of the problems right. that we have with human health. Think about all the people with arthritis and all the aches and pains. Now, it is true we're living a little longer, but but uh, the quality of life in a lot of cases, uh, if you look at our bone density and some of the things that are going on, we're, we're not as maybe healthy as, as what we could be if we were eating better food. So I think it's all related. It's it's very interesting to study. I think there's a lot of new innovations out there, things that are we're starting to make these linkages together. And uh, uh, slowly but surely, the, the other professions are starting to look at this. I mean, we all know good food when we eat it. You can you can taste the difference. I mean, and those are the flavonoids. And and our bodies, we're just like, a. in that sense, we're like a cow. If you give a person a bad, uh, let's say, a, a, a nutrient-dense uh, tomato and one that's less nutrient-dense, if you bite into the, the one that tastes good, you'll eat all that one first. And if you're still hungry, you might go after the other one, but you'll say, man, this one just doesn't taste right. as good. You, We can sense the difference. We're just not quite as good at it as maybe the, the cow can smell it. We have to actually eat it or taste it before we're probably going to be able to tell the difference. You might be able to weigh it, but, you know, yeah. there are new machines out there. I don't know if you've heard about this, but they have now – come up with one that's probably going to hit the supermarkets here pretty soon. It costs a couple hundred dollars, but you can actually test your produce now to tell you how nutrient dense it is. So that's kind of a new innovation that's coming out that I think people will start to get into this nutrient density a little bit more. And that may have an influence on us and how we're going to be producing our produce in the future. So does it really come down to then? I know there's no, absolute answer to this and i don't think anybody knows but is a healthier plant just lacking photosynthesis it's not photosynthesizing at its full potential the nutrients the minerals might be there in the soil it just can't get access to them like what's causing the plant to be healthier and this goes back to that yield thing of 200 bushel corn yeah. versus 1100 bushel corn what what yeah. could tip that limit? How do you get better photosynthesis? How do you get healthier plants? You got to have the microbes. And so it's all about that soil environment. When we start to till the soil, we get uh, imbalance of microbes. We're mainly bacteria and not enough fungus. We want to have that balance. So the soil compaction and it's going to have an impact. You're going to have more bacteria. So now you're going to have that imbalance. You're not going to have the right nutrients. And if you don't have the right nutrients, you might have the nutrients there, but it may be in the wrong form. And if it's not plant available, then we're going to limit photosynthesis. So it's all these things combined. You got to have the right soil environment. You got to have the mi right microbes. And then uh, a lot of times the nutrients are there, but they're in the wrong form. You got to have the right microbes to transform them into the right form so that they're plant available. And then that whole system then will add more carbon into your soil. Over time, you'll build up that carbon in your soil. Now you're at full production. But think about this. If we overuse fungicides, we start overusing the chemicals. Glyphosate is one of those examples. So we know that glyphosate is a chelator, okay? So it ties up a lot of micronutrients, okay? Especially uh, manganese and, and a couple other things. But um, one of the things that we're seeing on almost all of our soybeans and a lot of our corn is it's manganese deficient. Well, that's going to limit photosynthesis, okay? And so uh, the theory used to be that uh, a lot of people would talk about the staves in a, uh, in a uh, barrel, and they say whatever element is limiting, that's the one that's going to um, you know, limit your photosynthesis, limit your yield. But what has happened over time is because we put on so many nutrients, sometimes we have an excess nutrient. So the, the barrel stave idea is the law of the minimum. Now we're starting to concentrate a little bit more on the law of the maximum. And what does the law of the maximum say? Every nutrient has an effect on other nutrients. So if you get too much of one nutrient, it can tie up 
some of the other nutrients, okay? So maybe by actually cutting back, we, we tend to overapply nitrogen and phosphorus and even uh, uh, potash a lot or, or potassium. If we're overapplying them, we could be tying up some micronutrients. So maybe if we put on a little bit less of some of these and maybe we add a little bit of the other ones, but we also improve the biology, all of a sudden we get things back into balance and all of a sudden our barrel, all of a sudden the staves are a little more even and we can hold more water in that barrel, which means we're basically generating more yield. And maybe not only more yield, but maybe more nutrient dense and healthier food at the same time. So it all works together. We got to understand it. That's why it's been it's been a little bit complicated. We haven't understood how the pieces all move together and how they all fit together. We're starting to get a little clearer understanding on what we need to do to make this system work better. So again, glyphosate, what it does is it creates conditions that chelate manganese. Manganese is used by the plant uh, to split the uh, water molecule uh, in half. And uh, if you don't have enough manganese, you're going to have um, uh, incomplete photosynthesis. Uh, glyphosate also causes more uh, a fusarium in the soil. So now we're getting this disease organism there. One good way to overcome uh, glyphosate is actually oats. Oats does the exact opposite. It promotes uh, uh, manganese, makes manganese more plant available, and it reduces some of the fusarium in the soil. So we can use cover crops. I would suggest that, that people, we've really overused Roundup, try to use like crimper rollers and uh, maybe um, try to limit how much you use. If you're going to use Roundup, try to, instead of using it three, four times a year or five times like they do in cotton, maybe try to use it only once. Or if you can get away with not using it at all, use a crimper roller, use Gramaxone. We, we actually find with Gramaxone, we don't see a, a dip in soil health. Every time that we use um, Roundup, we'll actually see the soil health go down in the soil for a couple of weeks until that soil recovers. But we really want to keep our microbes happy all the time. And and uh, I think glyphosate is, is starting to reach its economic life. There's a lot of lawsuits out there and uh, we've overused it. And I, I think uh, over time, we're probably going to have less reliance on, on glyphosate just because of the economic forces now and, and the resistance to uh, the overuse of, of glyphosate. So we need to start thinking ahead of what are we going to use to replace that uh, glyphosate and uh, see yeah. if there isn't something else. I'm not saying we have to totally get rid of it. I'm just saying maybe we've overused it. Maybe we can cut back a little bit and we'll find out that maybe it, it actually improves our soil health a little bit more. So, yeah, I think one so of the, it, it also has an impact on phosphorus, right? But that's that that's pretty hard to talk about. I, I don't I know just enough to be dangerous on that, <laughs> so I prefer not to talk about it. But it it can have an impact on that. I think one um, of the knocks on big ag is it's unsustainable. Corn and soy rotation, two crop mm -hmm. rotation, that you know, right? Seven tons of topsoil going off per year. You know, you're, you're using sprays, you're using all these inputs. Do you, based on what you know, and you kind of intuiting the rest, mm -hmm. do you think we could get to a day mm -hmm. where we could keep the same amount of corn and soy production, only we could remove mm -hmm. all inputs from the system, fertilizer inputs by just mm -hmm. cover cropping in there. So we're removing inputs, our, mm -hmm. we replace that with cover crops and our yields are near where they are now? Great question, and uh, we're headed down that road. So if you look at organic production and the, the interest in organic, there's like 10 times the demand for organic production. But what's the problem with organic? It's, it's really not as organic as it sounds because we're doing tillage, okay? So we're ruining soil structure with that. Now, if you look at the uh, another road, uh, if you look at the no-till and the cover crops, you know, we're still using chemicals, uh, some herbicides and some fungicides and things like that. But more and more, the no-till and the cover crops and uh, that we're using less and less fungicides, less and less herbicides. I think the organic road and the no-till and the cover crop road are converging. The no-till and the cover crop guys are becoming more and more organic. The organic guys 
uh, haven't quite figured it out yet, but they're starting to figure out. And there's one guy that kind of embodies this, and that's Rick Clark. Rick Clark farms about 7,000 acres. He's long-term no-till. He's cover crops, and he's now organic. 7,000 acres, corn, soybeans, and wheat. And what he's doing is he, he starts with maybe a hay crop, and then he'll, you know, he'll uh, uh, plant his corn into the hay, usually maybe uses an undercutter or, um, you know, terminates the, uh, the, the hay, plants his corn, lets the corn come up. After the corn comes, he'll, he'll use a short season corn, uh, and then he'll plant uh, two to three bushel of cereal rye into that. He'll roll that and uh, plant it. Well, first of all, he'll plant his beans into it, planting green. And then after the beans come up, yeah, maybe four or five inches tall, he'll roll it. And now he's conserving moisture and uh, he don't have to use herbicides. Now he has a few weeds, but he says after a couple of years, he says we have very little weed seed. And then after the, the, the soybeans, he goes to wheat. After the wheat, he plants a 10-way mix of cover crops. And uh, then he'll um, plant his corn green into that. And then he'll roll that. And he's using hardly any herbicides. He's got hogs and he's got uh, some cattle. There's his manure. There's his fertilizer. So he's not putting on a lot of fertilizer. He's not using treated seed and he's not using fungicides. And he will tell you that my yields are average, but my prices are way above average. I can live with average yields, but I'm making a lot more money by going organic because he's getting organic prices on that. And uh, his nutrient density is going up. He's got better quality feed. So maybe if you think about it from a yield aspect, maybe he's getting average yields. But when you're looking at pounds of protein harvested per acre, he's probably actually outdoing some of the other guys that have slightly higher yields. But again, his his prices uh, compensating for that. He said farming has now become fun again because you don't have to worry about all the chemicals. So do is you know, it possible? It's sorry already to a reality. Do you know where his input costs are relative to, say, a conventional farmer on the same amount of acreage? It, his input costs are so low that it, it, it and his, and his uh, prices are so much better, double what the other ones are that Yes, he's quite he's quite a bit more he's profitable than anybody else. And that's really what it's about is profit profitability per acre. He's sustainable, he's profitable, and he has nutrient dense good food. I mean, he's hit the jackpot. Like I said, this is reality. It's already here. We're starting to go down that road. Now, does he have a few problems now and then? Yes. But we have a lot of ways to to work with this. We have weeders now that are, you know, um, gas-powered uh, little robots that can go up and down the row and take out, uh, with electrical charge, take out weeds. We have, um, you know, the propane. Uh, uh, you can go up and down the rows with propane and, and burn off some of the weeds. And if you have healthy plants, you're not going to have as many insects and, and uh, things like that. He has less disease. Um, you know, he might have to work on his genetics and things. And that doesn't mean that once in a while he doesn't have a blow up, you know, uh, there might be years where things don't go so well, but you know what? He's got pretty good profit margins. He's banking some of that money. He can, he can take a hit once in a while. And, uh, like he says, farming now has become a lot more enjoyable than what it was, you know, just five, 10 years ago when he was, he was trying to really push yields. And that's all we really should be talking about optimal yields, not maximum yields. And and maybe for him, optimal is just having average yields, but having really good nutrient density. That actually, when we look at the protein levels again, uh, that might actually be better. And it's much, much more profitable for him. His margins are low. Well, the most so, always doesn't happier. equate with better, you know. That's right. Okay. That's right. You know, a lot of people so, listening to this, I'm, they're working on one seven thousandth of the land he is, and it works for him. So... I know you work big ag, but for somebody growing on a small scale, like intensive vegetable production, mm -hmm. how would you think about some of these pr yeah. principles if you were trying to integrate them into that? Is it the same thing? Just try and continually cover crop, keep fields covered when they're not yes. in use, maybe companion plant alongside or interplant tomatoes, right. but you have a cover crop alongside them. When you think about growing small scale Vegetable. vegetables, what do you think? Yes. So for vegetable production, what we see is, 
cereal rye works really well. You can grow cereal rye and then you can roll it. And then after you roll it, you can transplant tomatoes. You can transplant uh, melons, you know, watermelon, must melon. Uh, works really well with beans and peas. You can just plant the peas and the beans in there and then let them come up. Uh, a crop roller works really well um, because we're actually finding out with the crop roller that you let those beans or peas get up just a little bit. And when you nick them a little bit with the crop roller, it sends a hormonal response to them. They actually put on more pods. Uh, per per plant. So we're finding out that uh, it not only helps with weeds, it keeps the ground cooler, it conserves moisture, uh, but it also gives you a little bit of a yield increase. So uh, there's a lot of ways of doing it. I, I think something else that people need to be looking at is uh, some of the inoculants and uh, even like I'm doing some little bit of research with worms, uh, red worms, um, you know, a ton of, uh, uh, it takes three ton of, um, let's say, uh, carbon straw or leaves or anything that's made of carbon will decompose uh, with the worms down into about a ton of fertilizer. And so three to one is generally the ratio. That ton of fertilizer is worth about $400. And so you can you can uh, put out some um, uh, rows and uh, of uh, just leaves that you get from the city if you wanted to, and uh, you can put your worms in there and uh, let them do the work for you. It takes about a year for that all to decompose and go, and it's so rich in nitrogen, phosphorus, a lot of the micronutrients, and you can just keep adding to it a little bit. And then uh, when the time comes, you can uh, spread that out on your field. And that makes a really, really good compost. I mean, the, the plants just absolutely go nuts on it because it's a highly enriched organic fertilizer. And you can do it on your own. You don't have to pay somebody. You got trucking involved, but unless you're growing it yourself, but uh, most of the time you're probably going to get it from from maybe another source. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I'm looking into that myself, getting some leaves and maybe a straw, or you might even, if you're growing the sorghum, you can take the sorghum them back if you wanted to cut some of that up and bail it you could turn that into um, uh, organic uh, fertilizer that you could reapply maybe to other fields maybe you have one field that's a little high in nutrients you can transfer some of those nutrients to another field that way there's a lot of different ways to work this just depends on your situation so what, what about above ground amendments you go to any ag trade show and you go to an exhibition hall mm -hmm. and it's loaded with companies that have stuff that you can apply above ground micronutrients enzymes biostimulants mm -hmm. you name it mm -hmm. do you think that's I, I think people love that stuff because it seems like a quick fix it's easy i can buy it i can put it on and yeah. i feel like i did something where do you feel like that's a down the line approach you look at that stuff after you know you've minimized tillage after you got a continual cover over the soil right. after you have a living room then look at that stuff you I, I would agree with you. you. If you're just going to put it on the first year, if you still have compaction, if you don't have the right soil environment, you're probably wasting your money. You've got to make the first investment. In, you need to at least start to heal your soil a little bit, because if you have anaerobic conditions out there, saturated soils, compacted soils, that's not the ideal environment for a lot of these aerobic type of bacteria, fungi, and whatnot. Uh, so um, probably the best thing is at least get into it a year or two, and then you can start to experiment with, with uh, some of the, uh, the microbes. But you got to start to heal your soil compaction. You know, the first thing I tell everybody, at least here in the Midwest, now this isn't going to apply everywhere, but uh, first thing you need to do is make sure you got good drainage. If you don't have the tile, we need to have a, a, a soil. If it's saturated and you got standing water, about the only thing that, you know, at least here we can't even grow rice, so we're too far north, but you, you, you can't have saturated soil. So you got to have an outlet for your water. Once you get your soil in shape, if you're going to land level it or do, do all that at first, soil test it, see where you're at, and then start growing, you know, try to get wheat in the rotation and after wheat, put in multi-species cover crops. That will do a lot to healing your soil. If you're going to do grazing or something or other, that's fine. Go on some of those fields, maybe rotate it out and then start your no-till and then uh, maybe do some testing, figure out what you're lacking. And that's our biggest problem right now. We don't know 
For example, on mycorrhizae, there's like 250 species of mycorrhizae. Our problem right now is we don't really know what we have and we don't know what we need. And we don't know if the product that we're buying has what we, we want in. A lot of times it doesn't. Now, there is one product I know that, that does pretty good. And, and uh, you know, I'm not trying to make a pitch for them, but I have used it and it works. And the reason I know it works is I did some research on it uh, over um, between Christmas and New Year's a couple years ago. And I looked at all the different species of mycorrhizae and I found one that gives, gives about a 10% yield increase on soybeans. Well, it just so happens that this company, it's Valen, it's their endoprime. And what's interesting, the reason I like that product is they give you a money back guarantee that you'll get a yield increase. If you don't, now you have to go to the extra work, you put out a control plot where you don't, and then you put out, uh, you know, the rest of your field, you can use it. It's about 12 bucks an acre, but when you put that on, about 80% of the time, they'll more than pay for the product. About 10, 15% of the time, they'll get a yield increase, but they may not quite pay for it. And I suspect the reason they may not quite pay for it, it's either one of two things. Like, for example, on Dave Brantz, they tried it on his. Dave already had the microbes. So either you have the microbe, or maybe you just don't quite have the right environmental conditions. Yeah. And it might take you two or three years till that will fully work for you. So what they're finding out is these products work on these no-till fields with cover crops maybe two to three years after that you've been totally inoculated your field and you don't even need the product anymore so it's a money back guarantee i think if they're going to give you a money back guarantee you have nothing to lose i think then you can go ahead and try it and what they like is the guys that do like strip till guys will put it on they'll see enough of an economic advantage that they want the product but they're going to need it every single year because the species that they have in there are so sensitive to tillage that they're killing them off every year. But they're still getting enough of an economic response that they're going to go ahead and buy it. So Valent loves those guys. They don't like the long-term no tillers and cover crops quite as much because they say, well, we can only sell them a product for two or three years, and then we got to go find somebody else because now their fields are inoculated and they find out they don't need it anymore. So, so I do think some of these products can be good. It's The problem is there's just so many of them. And, uh, you know, unless you do the trials, a lot of times they're not so good at telling you what's in their product. And you have to do the research on your own. So it's, it's. I mean, I pull my hair out trying to figure out and I can read the label. And unless they give me the species name, I really don't know what I'm buying until I try it. And even then, I may not know, I, you know, unless you got a lot of money and you want to have it tested. And that, that can be very expensive. Sure. So, um, you know. It's it's a it's like the wild wild west right now you know, with inoculants. It really is. But you know, a couple things you can do is some of these inoculants you can do yourself. You can make them yourself. So I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, um, I went out and I really was researching mycorrhizae. So I found out that there was a recipe for making your own mycorrhizae. I went out and got eight virgin soils, brought back about a barrel of each mixed them all up, and then put them in this medium. I had a, about a 16-foot a by 12-foot area that I, I made my own little mixture, put this in there, and started growing my own mycorrhizae, and then growing, you know, like oats and sorghum sedan and some vegetables in there. After about two, three years, I got the inoculant level pretty high, and then you can broadcast that on your own fields. Now, you can't sell it. Because in order to sell it, you'd have to sterilize it, and that kind of defeats the purpose. But you can do this on your own. You can do that. The other thing you can do is with the worms, there's what we call a David Johnson is doing the static compost. And he's finding out that, um, you know, he, he's doing that and getting really good levels of healthy bacteria and different fungi in the soil, not the mycorrhizae, but other fungi and getting really good results with that. So I actually think that maybe rather than buying a lot of these things, maybe we ought to be looking at trying to grow things on our own. Uh, I totally but now agree companies with you don't like that, but yeah, yeah it's yeah, a lot you know, easier. I mean, I shouldn't say it's easier. It's actually a little more hard. There's a lot of labor involved, but, but if you have a low budget, 
uh, you can do these things on your own. I'm, I'm experimenting with uh, worm compost right now and uh, doing some things. And they are finding out, I think these uh, worms are just little inoculators. They've got all these different species of bacteria that they're inoculating the compost with. And it's not only, you know, as I look at my worm piles, I'm not only finding uh, worms, guess what else? There's all kinds of pill bugs and spiders and every critter imaginable. As a matter of fact, the other day I was putting a little extra water on my compost pile and out jumped a real little baby possum. And, you know, most people would have said, well, let's just compost the possum. But I'll tell you what, I left him go. I put a board in there so he could get out. Why did I do that? Because possums are very good at eating ticks. And I have a lot of deer ticks around my farm. And uh, I'm, I thought, you know what, I'm going to let that little sucker go because hopefully he's going to eat up the deer ticks. And I don't, I don't really like to be pulling off ticks all the time so so you know we gotta learn to live with mother nature sure thing yeah no i I love a lot of the suggestions insight you've brought in this episode is there anything you'd like to leave the listener or viewer with some final words to say hey if you're out there farming give this a try or do this Mm -hmm. or, or anything else well there's there's one thing that I, I found interesting. I probably should have added it on the other one, but well, uh, I, you know, on nitrogen, we know that compacted soils uh, hurts us with denitrification. Okay, we're losing sixty to eighty percent of our nitrogen from the soil from uh, in the Midwest from uh, denitrification. Okay, saturated soils. When we get those soils, they warm up. Uh, we can lose. 60 to 80 percent of our nitrogen that really hurts us on corn well you know i got to thinking about that and i was doing some research and uh, does compaction have an impact on phosphorus does it have an impact on potassium well I, i got to looking at it and i've done some research on phosphorus and we're finding out that under saturated soil conditions phosphorus becomes more soluble and it flows with the water under very saturated soil conditions. And that's due to the fact that uh, a lot of soils are high in iron and under saturated soil conditions, iron releases phosphorus. So let's think about this for a minute. As your organic matter levels go down, you have to use aluminum, iron, and calcium to tie up your phosphorus. Uh, One of the reasons that we have a lot of water quality problems in the Midwest and around the world is because we've lost a lot of the organic matter from our soils. The other thing that's happened is in the uh, 1980s, we started uh, the Clean Air Act. And what happened? We used to talk about acid rain. Nobody talks about acid rain anymore, but the pH of the water coming down was about four and a quarter. And over time, we've cleaned that up and it went to five and a quarter. And now it's at six and a quarter. Well, guess what? Under very acid conditions 20 years ago, we didn't have all this soluble reactive phosphorus in Lake Erie causing the harmful algae blooms, but we had acid rain. Iron under those acid conditions, when that rain would come down, would hold onto that phosphorus very tightly. But now as we've lost organic matter and we've got a lot of iron in our soils, and now the pH is two points higher. That's a factor of 100 times more alkaline. That means the iron is holding on to that phosphorus less tightly and it, it's being lost. Well, what's that got to do with soil health? The factor is we don't have the organic matter and a lot of people here are doing the vertical tillage. So what happens now is we got a compacted layer about an inch, two inches deep. When it rains, all the phosphorus is at the surface and now it's either going to go right down a crack to our tile line or it's going to flow off right into our soil. If we had the organic matter in a cover crop, We would get that to go down into the soil, and then the roots would take it up. What do roots absorb? Soluble nitrogen, soluble phosphorus. So now we see a relationship between soil compaction on nitrogen and phosphorus. Hmm. Do you think there might be a relationship to potash or potassium? Interesting thing, we've done some research in Ohio, Steve Kuhlman, last three years, we updated our um, uh, fertility guide, and they were looking at uh, potassium, they said something strange is going on with potassium, we don't understand it. The last three years, they went out and they soil tested, and they had, let's just say, a, a level of potassium, and then they would fertilize it, 
and then they would test the soil again. So let's say you put on, uh, you know, 100, 200 pounds of, of uh, uh, potassium fertilizer. What would you expect the soil test to do? Should it go up? Should it stay the same or should it go down? Should go up, right? Every time it went down. They said, what's going on here? And uh, I just happened uh, when Steve was talking about this, I was sitting in the back row. So I went up afterwards and I said, Steve, I said, uh, did you apply that in the fall? Yes. I said, did you broadcast that? Well, yeah, Jim, you know, that's typically how we put on potassium. And I said, uh, did you vertical till it in? And he said, yeah. I said, well, you know that under saturated soil conditions, when you vertical till that, and we've had three wet uh, falls in a row, what happened is you get potassium induction. And he said, what's potassium induction? Well, with our clay soil particles, what happens is potassium is a very small ion and under compacted saturated soil conditions, the clay opens up, it swallows up the potassium. That's why when they would soil test and after they broadcast it and they would work it into the ground and the soil was saturated a little bit, it would tie up the potassium and it would make the potassium unavailable. I went back and looked at a lot of our soil tests. And in very dry years, when uh, we have more oxidation, we would find pretty good levels of potassium. I looked at a soil test that was taken three years later on these same fields and it dropped by almost 200%. I mean, it went down that much just because we've had saturated soils, it's tying up our potassium. And again, that goes back to the compaction and the lack of soil health. And once you get your soil in good shape and you have soil health, you're gonna have better nutrient availability. You're gonna have healthier crops, more nutrient dense, and everything's gonna work a little bit better. You're gonna make more money because you're gonna have less input. So trying to get there though, that's the hard part. And uh, again, I would probably just tell people, you got to start. You can't wait. Uh, don't uh, don't wait too long uh, because it's not going to get any better. It's it's only going to get worse unless you take an active interest in it. Try to keep live roots out there year round as much as you can. And if people want to learn more about the work you're doing, where can they go? Yes. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I worked for Ohio State University for 24 years. I'm retired from there. Okay. Then I worked for the Natural Resource Conservation Service for three years as a soil health specialist. I uh, more or less quit that job. And now I have my own company. It's called Horman Soil Health Services. I'm working on a number of grants. I do consulting. Uh, I sell some cover crop seed. Uh, I also sell some uh, crimper rollers. I'm getting into that a little bit and uh, I'm doing a lot of different things. So uh, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, go to Horman Soil Health Services. That's S E R V I C E S, all, all one word, Horman Soil Health Services at gmail.com. That's my email. And if you want to go to my website, it's Horman Soil Health. Dot com And uh, if you go there, I've got all kinds of resources on a lot of fact sheets that I've written over the years, bowls and slugs and uh, biology of soil compaction, have a lot of different uh, PowerPoints. And I am also available to speak. Uh, uh, I am available to, to, to help farmers and uh, anybody who wants to. Uh, in these COVID times, it's been a little bit uh, difficult. Sure. Uh, we're doing more webinars and uh, staying home a little bit more. So, Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out some of the great clips and watch the full interviews right here on In Search of Soil.